I'm Craig Irvine. I'm the academic director for the master's program in narrative medicine. And I'm very, very happy to honor and uh, welcome all of you today to this event. Uh, I'd like to introduce our esteemed dean of the School of Professional Services, Jason Wingard. Thank you, Craig, and good evening, everyone. This is a uh, wonderful occasion. Thank you so much for joining us in this wonderful location. Isn't this a beautiful facility? Uh, absolutely. So we're glad to be here in, in this spot and glad to have a wonderful discussion this evening uh, during our SPS Spotlight Series, which will feature our narrative medicine program. Uh, again, my name is Jason Wingard. I'm the Dean of the School of Professional Studies. I see a lot of new faces here. So if you don't know about the School of Professional Studies, I'll just tell you that we are the newest school at Columbia University. We offered our first degree in 2002, so of all the 18 schools of Columbia, we are the newest, and we are decidedly different from the other schools because we are an inter interdisciplinary school. So we serve students who are in high school, undergraduates, post-baccalaureate, we have graduates, 14 master's degrees, executive education programs, and then post-retirement programs for the community as well. So we serve the widest breadth of students uh, of any school here at Columbia University. Uh, this evening, uh, I want to introduce two speakers who are with us today, and I want to put it in context. So again, we are a new school at Columbia, we are interdisciplinary school, and we really focus on trying to do a couple of things. One of them is for our students, the mission really is trying to connect what employers want, what kinds of trials and tribulations employers are going through, the skills and the demands that they're looking for. We try to train our students to be able to meet those demands. What it requires to be able to train students to do that in a very dynamic and ever-changing global environment is to have our ear to the ground, to listen to what employers are saying, to listen to what those companies need, and to hear from thought leaders. And so we constantly are pushing for lifelong learning events like this, where we invite in thought leaders to tell us about what's happening out there so that we can teach our students in practice. And professors like Dr. Craig Irvine uh, are leading the way. And so one of Dr. Irvine's esteemed students um, is Dr. Gayatri Devi. And so uh, we are very proud of what she's been able to accomplish. Uh, she is a neurologist and she has been uh, doing a lot of work, including writing her brand new book. And I'll tell you the title and I hope that you're able to get uh, a copy of it. It's called Spectrum of Hope an optimistic and new approach to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. So she'll be signing copies of her book uh, after this session. They're gonna be talking about this today. So again, uh, Dr. Devi is a neurologist. She is a graduate of our MS program. She is a writer. She is a lecturer, she is a thought leader, uh, she is a researcher, and her book uh, is truly tremendous, and I won't give you any hints on that, but you still be talking about that. She's going to be interviewed by someone I know you all know and love and respect, and that is Miss Gloria Steinem. And Miss Steinem needs no introduction, but she is also a writer and a teacher and a lecturer, and she is a political activist, uh, and she has done so much to advance the feminist organization and the movement over the last three decades or so. And so we are very pleased to have Dr. Devi and Ms. Steinem here tonight to talk about uh, this new book and to hear your questions and answers when the time comes. So thank you very much. Without further ado, we will get started. Good evening. Yeah. Since I read your wonderful book, I've felt that we are at the beginning of a new era. I mean, some of us here remember when cancer was the big C, right? And just to say the word was thought to be a death knell, right? It seems to me now for the first time, thanks to your work especially, we are beginning to be able to see Alzheimer's as something that is not all one 
dis, dis, you know, dictate on our future, that it comes in many, many different forms. How did you realize this? Was this through research, through listening to patients? How did it come to you? So um, I've been working in the field of memory disorders for 23 years, subspecializing spe, sub in that area. And what I was realizing is that what I had been taught was that Alzheimer's was this one disease, right? It's just patients came in, they had Alzheimer's, we'd make a diagnosis, and before long they'd end up in a nursing home. That was what I'd been taught. And what I was finding was something very different. I was finding that there were patients with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's who were stable and stayed stable forever. I found that there were patients with Alzheimer's who were responding to treatment. I found that there were patients with Alzheimer's who were getting better with treatment. And there were patients with Alzheimer's who fit that classic mold. And actually, I came to this, to this idea that Alzheimer's was really a spectrum disorder, like autism is a spectrum disorder, based on seeing thousands of patients over this 23 years in the area and realizing that the face of Alzheimer's is based on each individual patient. That each patient, if I met one patient with Alzheimer's, I met one patient with Alzheimer's. That didn't define for me everyone else. And then when I started looking at the research in the field, I found that there were three types. There were people with rapidly progressive Alzheimer's, there were people with moderate Alzheimer's, there were people with mildly progressive Alzheimer's, there were people who had Alzheimer's pathology who never developed symptoms, there was the whole category of mild cognitive impairment, and also that only about 50% of people had the classic Alzheimer's where they had memory problems. The other 50% did not even present with memory problems in the beginning. They had other types of cognitive deficits. And all this to me was a revelation because we knew that in medicine and we read about it, but then when we think about Alzheimer's, we think about it as a monolithic disease. No, it, it seems to me that we are getting rid of another scarlet letter, right? The letter A. Yeah. And this is crucial, and it's interesting to me that it came to you out of stories, out of narratives, not out of the laboratory. That's right, and I think that's where, you know, being in the narrative medicine program was so helpful too, is it really matters to listen to patients and listen to their stories and not to have a preconceived idea of what an illness was, which is how I started out. Um, and then I realized, well, here's this patient with Alzheimer's 15 years into their diagnosis teaching me about what the word polemical really meant. Um, and he may not remember what he had for breakfast, but he was perfectly capable of giving me a whole lesson in etymology. So I realized that I was really needed to listen to the stories of patients, and that's truly how, and then when you go back and look at the research, it totally made sense that depending on the areas of the brain that the pathology affected, different people responded differently. Depending on where in the brain the pathology um, caused death of cells, because you could have deposition of these plaques and tangles in the brain that's pathognomonic for Alzheimer's disease and still not have cell death because there's the, the immune system may somehow modulate the destruction of cells um, that we were kind of looking at this in a very coarse way and we needed to look at it for, you know, in a much more tailored fashion based on each person. I mean, what's more individual than your brain? Mm. Um, and it's, I thought it was not in the service of the patient to put them all in the same category. Well, it, it gives me faith too, and maybe a lot of us here who are not scientists and not physicians, that we can better understand Alzheimer's because it is a narrative, it is a story, and it seems to me that in any case our brains or our thoughts are organized by narrative. I mean, we've been sitting around campfires for 100,000 years <coughs> for a reason, telling stories. Right. And the Native Americans who were once here on Manahatta Island, you know, said that when you were ill, you lost your story. 
So in some sense, we are kind of coming full circle. But you also discovered that the differences uh, in the treatment by gender and by race. Right, right. So there's a lot of, a lot of what I've found is that um, women particularly suffer from Alzheimer's. I mean, this is well known, it's well established, not, not by me, but researchers in the field, and that women are far more likely to be caregivers, women are far more likely to be full-time caregivers of patients with Alzheimer's. But when you have Alzheimer's as a woman, um, you are more likely also to end up in a nursing home as opposed to men who end up more often staying in the community. Um, and then another area that I've spent a lot of time working on is in terms of women with memory loss around the time of menopause. So women who are going through in their 40s and 50s, and this is not just women, men also go through what's called andropause in their 40s and 50s where they begin to have changes in their cognition. But women start to notice problems with finding words, they have trouble with coming up with lists, and the pattern almost mimics that of what you see in early Alzheimer's disease. So unless you ask for changes in menstrual patterns, changes in uh, menstrual cycles in women in their 40s and 50s, there is the possibility that you would misattribute the cognitive changes to something like Alzheimer's rather than something like menopause. So I think awareness needs to be raised in that area. And also women tend to present differently. Women more often are likely to have depression as a presenting symptom. They're more likely to have anxiety as a presenting symptom. And it's very important that when you make the diagnosis that you make it early in the course of the condition because the earlier you make the diagnosis, the better the treatment, the better the prognosis. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to instead treat depression or anxiety and miss the underlying uh, problem of Alzheimer's, um, then you lose the opportunity to intervene early. So I think women bring to the table certain um, nuances and differences in presentation that physicians need to be aware of, that people who are concerned that they have cognitive problems need to be aware of. But why is it different? I mean, you mean that a man who is losing his memory just assumes everyone else is losing <laughs> <laughs> well, men are, you know, there's data on this. Men are far more confident than women. And I have to tell you, in all these years uh, in practice, uh, it is, I've never yet, ever, um, come across a man who has cognitive issues who says to me, I should give up driving. <laughs> okay. Women, I would and say. And they talk about women drivers, okay? <laughs> so, women, about. on the other hand, um, I would say are more likely to do that. They'll say, you know, I got a little worried, I got a little nervous. Um, so, the, the women are more likely to seed certain key measures for independence. They're, you know, more likely to say, I'm giving up driving or I don't want to take care of the finances, which they never, a lot of times, they're not really doing that, but they get more leery of handling things and their self-confidence is far more easily punctured by the diagnosis of Alzheimer's than a man, man would be. And so that's very interesting for me to see, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and when it comes to caregiving, uh, it, women end up doing the caregiving m more, right? Yeah. But there are men also caregiving for women with Alzheimer's, right? Sure. And what are the differences there? So, um, so here's the difference. So, you, so I can talk about spouse caregivers because that's a good group to kind of compare. So. Men and women are, can be loving caregivers, but if you're a male spouse of a, female, of a woman with Alzheimer's, then you are far less likely to spend time taking care of them full time. The male spouse is much more likely to hire care, a caretaker or get some 
other paid caregiver to, to give help. A female spouse who is the caregiver of a male patient is far more likely to provide full-time care, 24-7 care, give up job promotions, change her job to be a part-time position just to be able to support. And even if the male spouse ends up being going into a nursing home, the female spouse is far more likely to drive to that nursing home on a daily basis and help to take care of the patient. So there is a level of intensity that comes with the caregiving that women give to men in this situation that is less intense when the situation is reversed. Also, women are more likely to take care of very labor-intensive things like toileting and bathing, and male caregivers are far more likely to take care of things like bookkeeping. Um, and administrative things. So there is, there is a physical and an emotional toll on female caregivers. Um, and um, what's also interesting is, and this is, this is something that I have anecdotal information on, I don't have, um, there's no data on this yet, which is that in these last 23 years, um, I've had probably about three dozen male spouse caregivers who have taken, um, because their wives are ill, they've chosen to have uh, uh, a lover. And uh, on occasion, the lover has come to the office with the patient uh, because the, the, the lover functions as an adjunct caregiver, if you will. And in all these years, which sounds, which sounds terrible, but to me wasn't really, I, I felt that these men who were doing this were actually at some level trying to keep someone that they loved at home instead of putting them in a nursing home. And at the same time also attend to their <coughs> own needs. So I thought that was wonderful that they were doing that. The problem is that the corollary which is that um, for women caregivers, they rarely ever um, seek intimacy outside the marital relationship in these situations. And the one instance that it happened, the wife was ostracized by her family and her husband's family, and she had to move out of state with her husband and her lover. So it was a very dramatic situation. I'm sure there are other instances that I just don't know about. But I wish there were parity in, in this. You can't uh, make this up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but the, but the idea, I think, I think male caregivers are better at nurturing themselves, which is true actually about w women and men in general, and that women tend to neglect their own needs far more often in this equation. Um, and so, you know, they won't even go for an evening with friends because, uh, because they're worried about their husband being home alone. Well, I can see that you have a sequel book here called <laughs> The Politics of Alzheimer's, right? But also you were saying that there's difference, uh, differences in diagnosis depending on race as well, that there are racial differences. Right, so the way a diagnosis of Alzheimer's is made is that you uh, notice you have cognitive issues, whether it doesn't have to be memory issues, it could be trouble finding words, trouble making change, um, it could even be changes in your mood that's persistent, that you think is affecting your functioning, you've had an evaluation and the rest of your hormones, your uh, thyroid, et cetera, everything else is fine, and then they, you get referred to a specialist. Um, and then what someone like myself would do is we would uh, evaluate you first, make sure a good neurological exam is done, and after that, uh, possibly have you get a cognitive evaluation. And a cognitive evaluation is where you are asked a series of questions, both to establish your fund of knowledge, as well as to see which areas of memory or attention or calculation that you might have difficulties with. 
And these questions are, despite our best efforts, very much skewed towards mainstream culture. Um, so for example, if, you're, if you've not been taught to take good tests well, you're not going to perform well on these tests. Um, and women, um, you know, traditionally do less well on these tests than men. Um, and if you are from a minority group, you tend to do less well. If you are less educated, you tend to do less well. So your scores are not going to be as, ref compared to other people in your age group, as, as good as you'd want them to be. So it skews the um, diagnosis a little bit so that there's more of a tendency to diagnose cognitive uh, dysfunction in people with lower educational attainment, people from um, minority groups. So it's somewhat like the bias in college entrance exams which you yeah. know, ha has been a, s a subject of study for, for many years. And do you feel we need that kind of endeavor looking at these tests too? I, I hope that in the future we have a finer way of determining how much, how our brain's functioning with different tasks. I still feel we're, we're not yet at, at, at the, we're still fairly coarse in our evaluation um, in terms of defining dysfunction, uh, but I'm hoping we'll get, we'll get there. Well, I'm sure that a lot of us here are still worried about the Scarlet A, right? Yeah. So perhaps we can spend a certain amount of time before our question and answer time talking about uh, the new treatments and also uh, new ideas in prevention. Right, right. So I think one of the things, Gloria, I wanted to mention too is that um, the scarlet A, which you've mentioned a few times, mm -hmm. so the scar, it's because Alzheimer's is so stigmatizing, right? So because we don't understand that it's a nuanced disease, that it's a heterogeneous disease, that there are multiple different subtypes of this disease, that people respond differently to it, that we treat everybody with Alzheimer's the same way. And some, somehow, I think two things happen. One is that when I have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, particularly if I'm a woman, I'm going to view myself differently. You know, I, I think I'm going to see myself, I've seen this often with my patients, as less competent, less, um, you know, it's almost as if I've given myself uh, a failing grade before I even try. So there's a certain withdrawal um, there's a certain self-recrimination, uh, all of that happens, but that's within me. The person who's dealing with me, and this happens with physicians, and it happened to me a lot during my first few years in practice, which was that as soon as I diagnosed someone with Alzheimer's, I started treating them differently. You know, somehow just giving them that letter A branded them in some way, and somehow, you know, it was just subtle. In subtle ways, I started thinking that they weren't quite as competent, you know. I would tell them, you're going to take your medications, and then I'd be like, are you going to take your medications? So, and then I realized I was doing that. And it was a big step for me to not do that. And now I've gotten to the point where a lot of my patients will say, don't forget now, you know, uh, who have Alzheimer's, who, I, and I'm able to have a, a back and forth that's not under the auspices of this stigmatizing letter A. So along those lines, I also tell patients, be circumspect about who you discuss the Alzheimer's diagnosis with, because if you tell people their idea of Alzheimer's is informed perhaps by one particular person at the far end of the spectrum who perhaps is not functioning and they're going to treat you like someone who's not competent. So going back to college exams and, you know, and high schools and minorities and all of this, you know, if you're not treated like you're competent, you're not going to believe that you're competent. You're going to behave in ways that kind of engender that. It perpetuates a stereotype. So until I think we are all more aware of the spectrum of Alzheimer's, it's important to, to be careful about who you tell. Um, so getting back to the idea of treatment and prevention. So 
there are two big concepts that I think are very helpful in terms of thinking about the brain. First of all, this idea of brain reserve, which is the total number of brain cells that we have. And um, usually most of us have about 100, 100 billion brain cells. We have 100 trillion connections. It's very hard for me to put my to wrap my mind around that because those numbers don't mean anything to me. But basically, we have a lot of brain cells. We have <laughs> tons of connections. Um, the good news is, until you die, until the day you die, you can alter your connections. You can make, you know, even if you wiped out 50 billion brain cells, hypothetically, you could still maintain 100 trillion connections if you allow the remaining nerve cells to sprout like a tree in springtime and suddenly connect with other nerve cells so that they can do the job that nerve cells do, which is to communicate with each other. So it's very important when you think about the brain and the idea of Alzheimer's and the presence of all these plaques and tangles in the brain that if you can improve you can't, I mean, brain reserve is kind of a given thing. You're born with a certain number of cells. If you have a big head, you have a small head. If you have had strokes, uh, those kinds of things will, will uh, alter your brain reserve. Cognitive reserve, which is what's your cognition really like, which is kind of interlaced with the brain reserve, has to do with the idea of how many, you know, what do you do? Do you exercise? Do you go out with friends every night? How often do you get drunk? Who do you, uh, what kinds of classes do you take? What, how do you keep those connections sprouting and engaged with each other? So it's the, it's the, it's the combination, the interplay of the two, brain reserve and cognitive reserve, which can protect your brain cells and protect your connections. So even when you are faced with an onslaught and an assault of plaques and tangles, you can still keep your brain functioning. And they've looked at this. They've looked, the wonderful study was a nun study where they looked at nuns in Philadelphia who had all written letters when they first got into the convent. Why did they want to get into the convent? What was the reason why? And then they looked at their brains when they died in their 80s and 90s, and they found that the nuns who had the most number of ideas per sentence as novitiates getting in when they were in their teen, teenage years were the ones who were most protected against the plaques and tangles when they died. So there were nuns whose brains were riddled with plaques and tangles who still were functioning well without any evidence of Alzheimer's. The other thing my friend Tom Wisniewski at NYU does some of this research is that they've now found, and there's a lot of research on immunology and what happens in the brain, that, he, that people who have rapidly progressive Alzheimer's may have brains that have a very different immune response that causes their cells to die faster and the neurons to not have as many branches as opposed to somebody who has mildly progressive or somebody who has moderately progressive Alzheimer's disease. There, so there may be immunologic modifiers as well. So having said that, how do you treat Alzheimer's? You treat Alzheimer's by basically amping up your brain reserve and your cognitive reserve. Cognitive reserve seems relatively easy to do. You can use you basically want to increase the sprouting between nerve cells, so you want to make sure those nerve cells are active. So one of the things that we do, that I strongly believe in, is that when we do our initial evaluation of a patient and we find, say, a patient has a problem with language retrieval, then we work with cognitive exercises in those areas to help the person um, increase the robustness of that particular network. Um, if, you know, memory is a much harder thing to directly target because it's further deep in the brain, uh, but there are now um, treatments that are approved in Europe where, um, and Israel, where you can actually target certain parts of the brain and allow those networks to uh, be better um, stimulated and, and become more robust um, using magnetic <laughs> coils. So that's cognitive reserve. In terms of brain reserve, 
anything that you can do to increase blood flow to your brain. So aerobic exercise three times a week, which I abhor, but that's apparently <laughs> something that's really good for brain reserve. Um, you want to make sure that you eat a diet that's good for your heart. People have asked me over, they ask me over and over again, what kind of a diet is a good Alzheimer's diet? A good heart diet is a good Alzheimer's diet. So a good Mediterranean diet is great for Alzheimer's. It's great for preventing Alzheimer's. It's great for preventing um, a deterioration while if you do have Alzheimer's. Um, it, to reduce cholesterol levels, to keep your blood pressure low, to prevent diabetes. All of these are individual ways in which to increase your brain reserve. I mean to increase your cognitive reserve and to keep your brain as healthy as possible. Um, now the treatments that are currently available, there are certain myths that I really um, worked hard to overcome myself because they are so strongly um, inoculated into the thinking of memory disorder specialists uh, and also into our general psyche. Uh, one is that treatment of Alzheimer's doesn't work. That is not true. There are patients where treatment does not work, but the vast majority of patients do benefit from treatment, and there's a small subgroup of patients who actually improve on treatment. The second myth is that everybody with Alzheimer's ends up in a nursing home. Untrue. Um, do you know that if anyone were to guess what percentage of people with mild Alzheimer's go undiagnosed in an internist's office? 90 to 97 percent of mild Alzheimer's never gets diagnosed in internist's office. Half, 50 percent of moderate Alzheimer's doesn't get diagnosed in an internist's office, which means that the vast majority of people who are on the Alzheimer's spectrum have not even been diagnosed. So those are people that we really don't even have access to in terms of our data regarding what's happening to these people, what happens in the course of the illness, et cetera. So I think it's important to realize that. So that's, that's important to realize that, that it's a myth that we are going to end up in a nursing home with Alzheimer's. I think it's just a small fraction of patients in my experience. And that currently available treatments don't work. That is not true. Currently available treatments do work. Maybe not for everyone, but for a significant group of people. And then the third thing, I think, again, it's based on this whole fear, um, which is, and the, and, the, and the stereotyping of Alzheimer's and the stigmatizing of Alzheimer's, just like with breast cancer 30 years ago. Um, we're afraid. We're afraid to go in and get a diagnosis um, because then it means that we're done. You know, we just fold up, close up shop. Um, and I think. That also is untrue. I think the earlier you go in, the earlier you get a diagnosis, the more things you can do prognostically mm -hmm. to help. Yes, you yeah. could be president. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> OK, with that, I will open <laughs> the floor <laughs> to questions. <laughs> to questions. And also to answers. We could both use answers That's as well right. as questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please come to the microphone in the middle and line up. to ask questions like that. <laughs> I'm going to let Gloria answer that one. Well, we point out the politics, the, the, the gender and racial politics of a shared problem, right? And, and I think it's you know, very important that you did that. It makes us conscious in a new way, don't you think? And um, at the, in the same way, I would say that I mean, to, to, to humanize as well as smash the patriarchy. Um, it is crucial that men raise children as much as women do because that's how men get to be whole people. Or to be raised as a boy to raise children. I don't have children, but I was raised to have children. So I was raised to be empathetic and pay attention to detail and be patient and all those things 
that are wrongly called feminine but are just human. So for, in the same way that, that that's how we humanize the patriarchy by raising our sons to be as whole people as our daughters. Our daughters develop those other qualities by being active outside the home, by being daring, by being, you know, but we're all after our whole humanity. I, I would say pointing out the politics of caregiving at the other end of life, too, will help us. And, and rewarding the many men who are indeed real caregivers. Loving caregivers, right, yeah. Right. And even without lovers. That's right. <laughs> No, I, and, and that's the other thing too. There are many couples where they have intimacy and have sexual relations. And um, I have just the other day I saw a couple and my patient's husband said to me, oh, he says, our sex life is just fantastic now. And, uh, and she said, oh, stop, you know. <laughs> so, I, and they, she had had Alzheimer's for eight years and, and they're doing well, so. Can you come up to the mic so everyone can hear you, please? Do you want to talk on the mic, Laura? Yeah. I know that one of your roles is that you have to diagnose or consult with other doctors. all the doctors and people that you know that have been stigmatized and asked to leave their practice when in fact they're still brilliant because I just think that's such a startling revelation and that people really need to hear about that. Mm. So the question is, you know, uh, whether people can stay working with Alzheimer's and I strongly believe they can Again, if you think about Alzheimer's as a heterogeneous spectrum disorder, it makes perfect sense that yes, there are people who can continue to work. I'll tell you one story, which I actually, one of the many stories in my book, uh, which is a woman who came to me, she was in her, uh, she was 76, a doctor actually um, affiliated with a fairly well-known university here in the city. She teaches there and she um, also ran her own practice. Um, and she came to the office with her nurse. This was um, in the spring of 2013, uh, so four years ago. And she said she was devastated. And I said, why? She said, well, she'd been having memory problems. And so she went to see um, a doctor at uh, one of the medical centers. And she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And he told her that, she, and I know him, and I think he's great. And he told her that she had to stop working immediately. So she quit working as a professor. She quit working as a physician, but her big worry was she was very subspecialized in an area of medicine where she had had these patients, some of them since they were teenagers, and she'd seen them grow up, and some of them, you know, it was a very difficult area, and she was very worried about her patients. She said, I don't know what I'm going to do because they're all up in the air. We haven't, I haven't even had a chance to have them placed. So she, her nurse was also in the office, and she said, look, I've known this doctor for many years, we worked together, and she said, I really don't think there's anything wrong with her. But here she is with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So what ended up is New York State has this group called the Committee for Physicians Health, which is a committee that's specifically formed to help doctors um, in these situations, other situations where you have impaired physicians. And so they sent her to me. Um, and I saw her and I examined her and when we did this cognitive profile that I was telling you about earlier, Gloria, she scored at the 99th percentile. So she was smarter, certainly smarter than me, and smarter than many of the people that were her peers, women between the ages of 70 to 80, uh, who had had a college education. She did have some trouble with her memory. She was scoring at the 15th to the 30th to the 50th percentile. So compared to her general level of intelligence, she was somewhat diminished. But her memory was still better, better than 20% to 50% of women in her age group. So I decided that she could go back to work. 
So this may surprise you, and I always ask myself the question when a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or someone comes in, or an electrician uh, or a cop, and says, um, can I go back, you know, and I find out they have Alzheimer's, I say to myself, will I go see this person? Would I be confident to send someone I care about to this person? And I said to myself, this particular doctor, I would have no difficulty with going to see her or sending someone that I cared about to see her. So she went back to work. She continued to work. And then this year, she turned 80, or she was just about to turn 80. And so she told her patients in the last year that she had Alzheimer's. Uh, she said she was retiring. And she placed each of them, every single patient, in, with people that she thought would fit. She was perfectly at peace. And this year, I think it was just before summer, she stopped working. She, um, and then this whole time, these four years, I'd been on the phone with her internist. We were on the phone all the time talking about her. And she came in recently and she said, guess what? She said, the darndest thing happened. And I said, what do you mean? She said, do you know that my intern has had Alzheimer's? <laughs> and I said, what are you talking So it turned out her internist had had Alzheimer's the whole time. <laughs> and had been practicing, but had not told anyone. So my point is, <laughs> you could be pretty darn functional, because I had been talking to him all that time. I had no idea. So. <laughs> Well, it also, at, at the other end of this, your work with the NFL and l looking at undiagnosed, I mean, it, you know, stalwart, huge young guys who are supposed to be at their peak of mental abilities and are not. That's the opposite of this, right? Right. And that's, that's a really tragic situation. You know, I also consult for the NFL, and I... Um, meet with football players who are having cognitive issues. And it's really deeply sad. And the thing that I notice in them, which I also notice, and I'm talking about the politics of memory, um, in, me in politics of memory in so many ways, really, you know, memory for what people have done to you, <laughs> memory for, is that they are by far, even worse than women, which is saying a lot, worse advocates for themselves in terms of um, I will see a man in his 40s who's played with the NFL, who has access to a lot of resources, who has not seen a physician for his headaches that he's had every single day for 15 years. Um, I will see them and they want to, you know, with weakness in one hand, hasn't seen anyone for many years. So the level of advocacy I'm glad it's getting better because I think that's, that's very sad to mm. see. And that's also, I think, important in women. Um, you know, just recently I was thinking to myself, I said, why is it, why is it that women with Alzheimer's are always the first to say, you know, I stopped going out, I'm not, you know, I, I'm going to give up driving. And men re rarely ever do that. And I was surprised, Gloria said she knew this all along, but she mm. knows lots of things. <laughs> Uh, um, I was surprised that there was this big study of close to a million people in 40 countries, 48 countries, um, where they found that women across countries have lower self-confidence than men, which kind of sounds like a duh thing, but I was just glad that there was data on that, and that actually in Western countries, more egalitarian societies, that the self-confidence of women is even lower than in countries like in the East, in India, in Thailand, and places like that. So, interesting. We're, we're, we're back to how we smash the patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to ask you, and I find this a lot with, in the medical profession, um, dealing with doctors, that they never mention supplements. And like, like there are really good supplements that cross the blood-brain barrier that have been shown, proven in a lot of research studies to protect the brain from damage astaxanthin, alpha lipoic acid, then there's like really good amino acids, and acetylcholine, and acetylcysteine, and fish oil. All these have enormous studies behind them, but they never seem to be incorporated into the treatment strategies. And right. not, you didn't mention these at all when you talked about treatments, so I was just curious. Right. So the, the issue, I think supplements are wonderful. 
Um, there are certain, like fish oil, for example, is is great supplement. A lot of the B vitamins are good supplements. Um, in women, particularly, drugs that are vitamin D um, and calcium is important in women because it keeps their bones strong uh, and prevents falls and fractures, which also increases your risk for cognitive impairment. Um, the issue with supplements is that they are not well regulated um, so that what you take or you think you're taking is not what's actually bioavailable um, so that you think you may be taking something that's 20 milligrams or 30 milligrams of a certain supplement and then what becomes available in your body may be much more than that or much less than that and I think there's a big role for that for the future, but I think there needs to be better regulation of that industry. Yes, please, please come up to the mic and then you, you know, if you want to ask a question, All right. Thank you for this, this is incredible. My question for you is that there seems to be, and there is, there is a growing conversation in the medical community about the fact that we are maybe potentially spending too much money or too much time towards the end of life and towards saving, you know, and especially when we think about a disease like Alzheimer's, the, the dominant narrative is that it targets folks on towards the higher end of the age spectrum. How do you respond to to that sort of criticism or that sort of conversation that's basically saying that why do we why are we investing in this portion? What is what are we reaping the benefits of? Right. So the idea of end of life care, which Gloria and I have mm -hmm. talked about a lot as well. Um, you know, I agree. I think we're spending way too much. I think we in medicine we have to stop thinking about death as something that can be vanquished. Death is inevitable. Talking about death doesn't make death happen. Planning for death doesn't make it happen more fast, quicker. And to try to postpone death in the face of a hugely diminished quality of life is not a victory. And I think we in medicine are taught to save lives and to save lives at all costs. And I think that there has to be a, there, and I think there has, it's beginning to happen. We're realizing that this, this kind of saving someone so that they are not who they are, but their heart's beating, is not a victory for the medical profession. It's not a victory for that person. But we, we need to stop a compartmentalizing death, to stop um, just putting death in, you know, it's almost putting death, sanitizing death, not have death be a part of our lives, which it very much is. Um, and we have to be able to do that. So with all my patients, whether they like it or not, I'm always talking about healthcare proxies, talking about whether they've made living wills, talking about things that are very hard to do um, because I think the general idea is that if we talk about death, it just is that much closer to us. Gloria, tell me what. Uh, well, uh, I think we're all struggling with this and I am no expert because I think I'm immortal, which causes me. <laughs> <laughs> which causes me to plan poorly, okay. <laughs> but, um, but I do realize that as much as I love it here, I only want to be here while, while I can love it. You know, and that helps me. And I think preparing for it uh, in all kinds of ways. You know, what music do you want played? Who do you not want invited? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, however, <laughs> right. uh, the, the amazing thing is that it makes you, if you do that, it makes you enjoy life more. If you plan for your death, it makes you feel more. That's true, and that's true. And along those lines, I think the other thing too is that each of us has a different threshold for what we are willing to tolerate in order to live. 
So there are people who you think, how are they even enjoying their lives? And if you ask them, they say, look, I want to live. And there are other people you think, my God, they have it all. And they want to, they don't, they've decided they've had enough. So I think it's very much a personal preference too. And it's not for us to judge this is enough or not enough. Yeah. I, um, thank you so much for your perspective. I disagree with a lot of it but I can certainly appreciate it. You can say what you disagree with, that's okay. Well, I, I'm a full-time caregiver, not a caretaker, and uh, those were at the cemetery. I live a full life, I have a career, I've never not Good worked, for you, right? can we clap for her? This is great. No, no, because this is what I signed up for when I got married. I'm okay with this. I've had an opportunity that other people don't have. But my, my question to you would be, we talk about the big A. It's not the big A, it's the big D. Alzheimer's is not the umbrella. Dementia is the umbrella. How would you speak to that? You know, I have a husband who is now 67. He was diagnosed almost seven years ago. We found it an opportunity, um, devastating. He does not have Alzheimer's. He doesn't have anything like Alzheimer's. And I feel like the perspective tonight is that all dementias are Alzheimer's. My granny had it. My this had it. My husband was diagnosed at 60. He was a phenom in his field. So it's not like he doesn't have intelligence. And his favorite line, by the way, is, I am demented, I am not stupid. Right. Okay. So if you could please address the other dimensions in the room, it's like the big giant elephant. It's not a big A, it's a big D. Right. Thank you. So, thank you for that. Uh, first of all, I love that you are, so you're a full-time caregiver, are you, are you, you have paid help for your no. husband? Okay. My husband goes to a day center okay. that is specific to his dementia, okay. and specific, specific to young people. Okay, great. Thank you. So several questions and, and, and comments. First of all, I think it's wonderful what you said, which is, and what your husband said, which is, he said, I'm demented, but I'm not stupid. And I think that is very true, that we equate memory with intelligence. And that is, so when we start to lose the ability to remember, we think that that makes us stupid. And I know lots of people with impressive memories who are truly boring and quite stupid. <laughs> and I know lots of people with, who are kind of ditzy, who are fabulous and great. So I think that's very, very important. They, you can't conflate memory and intelligence. You know, that's a very important point. Now the other issue, the issue of dementia. So my book is actually called A Spectrum of Hope an optimistic and new approach to Alzheimer's and other dementias. And dementia actually is the umbrella term in terms of dementing or dementation, which is loss of brain cells causing loss of function that's irreversible from whatever the cause might be. Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. And it's the one that most of us fear the most because it's the one that we've heard about the most. But there are other kinds of dementia. There's vascular dementia, there's Lewy body dementia, um, there is dementia from a bunch of mul multitude, including infections. You know, heard of mad cow disease as a cause for dementia. Um, so there are multitudes of other types of dementias as well, and it's not to take away from what's happening with your husband. But it does I want take to take away from their treatment. Yeah. Because people ignore it. Right, no, that is, is true. It is treated as though it's not a dementia. Frontal lobe dementia was one that you left out. That's very, it's a lot more common than people think, and it hits only young people. Right, so. He's a rarity so, to be alive at 67. So here's what and I'm. Functional. Here, so the thing about the different types of dementia is if you take a person's story and you listen to their story and listen to the type of problems they have, then you're better able to categorize them as whether they have frontotemporal dementia, whether they have pro primary progressive aphasia, whether they have different types of dementia, and then you can tailor the care. I think what we need to do going forward, and what I'm hoping that will happen, is that we 
look at each person's brain and allow that to guide our treatment rather than, you know, I know people with frontotemporal dementia who are much older. I know people with frontotemporal dementia who are much younger, and you're right, there isn't enough research in the area. But I think when we think about it in terms of overarching categories, then you lose the individual person's story. So that's kind of what we need to focus on. Thanks. We have time for uh, one more question. Hi, I'm a um, narrative medicine student also. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question was, how, ha how has narrative medicine helped you overcome this previous bias of treating Alzheimer's patients with a sense of less competency. And have you shared this um, narrative medicine lessons, these strategies, with other colleagues, and how has been their response? So, um, so I always think, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do my job, right? Because I love my job. I love listening to patients. I li love their stories. But I wanted to be able to write about it, um, so I joined the narrative medicine program, I guess, maybe three or four years ago because I wanted to be able to better convey the stories of my patients to others so that it would resonate with them. Um, and to be able to use stories to take diseases like frontotemporal dementia or Alzheimer's and break it down into individual people and allow that people to resonate with stories rather than just statistics. Um, so I think narrative medicine has been very helpful in that regard in allowing me to translate stories of patients and um, to be able to then tell the stories to other people and in that way effect change, um, which I think I was less well able to do before I did, did the program. <laughs> Well, I think we have all uh, learned a lot, don't you think? A serious amount. <laughs> and most of all, we've all learned to treasure and value and listen to our own stories and to listen to others, right? That's the key to it all. So that, that it's, that it's a didactic exchange, and I think that's important. That, that's the other thing, too, that I found really wonderful about being a physician is that as I am more and more in the field, I realize that my patients are my healers as much as I heal them, that they help me a lot um, in terms of how I view the world. They teach me a lot on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'm able to help them the better for it. So I think it's very much a two-way street. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.